Hello, this is Yashveen. In this video, I'll be solving paper 2 within 2 May June 2021, 9700 Biology. Question number 1a, figure 1.1 is a photomicrograph of a region of eukaryotic tissue. Some of the cells in the stages uh, are in the stages of mitosis. And 1. Identify each stage, which stage of mitosis is shown in cell E and in cell F. So this one here is cell E and as you can see, the chromosomes are aligned along the center of the cell and so this would be stage metaphase and in F the chromatids are being pulled apart so that would be anaphase. Two microtubules are present within the cells that are in stages of mitosis but these are not visible in figure 1.1 state the function of microtubules and mitosis. Uh, they build up from the centrioles and they bind with centromere of each of the sister chromatids to pull them apart to the nuclear poles. 3. State with a reason whether figure 1.1 shows a region of animal or plant tissue. So when you observe this figure, you'd be able to see that most of these cells have the same sort of shape. And also, uh, if you look closer at the pictures, you'd be able to see a cell wall. For example, this one over here, these are plant tissues. B. Semi-conservative replication of DNA occurs during interphase before mitosis begins. Write the correct term in the spaces provided to complete each of the statements A to D. A. The DNA double helix unwinds and is separated into two template strands when certain bonds holding the two strands together are broken. So the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds that form between complementary bases. B. One of the template strands of DNA is copied in frag fragments. The enzyme is uh, a certain enzyme which is required to join the fragments together to form a continuous strand of DNA. That would be DNA ligase. C. Complementary DNA nucleotides are added to the template strands catalyzed by the enzyme DNA polymerase and you could get that idea from the fact that uh, you're joining together nucleotides which are the monomers of the polymer that is DNA and so the enzyme that joins together the monomers would be DNA polymerase. D. The regions of separate of repeating nucleotide sequence at the end of chromosomes that allow continued replication of DNA without the loss of genes. So those would be telomeres. Two sugars are transported within phloem sieve tubes from a source such as a mature leaf to a young leaf which acts as a sink. The young leaf also needs water and dissolved mineral ions which arrive at the leaf within xylem vessels. A. As a young leaf matures, the quantity of sugar taken up by the leaf decreases to zero but the need for water increases. Suggest and explain why the quantity of sugar taken up by the developing leaf decreases to zero over time but the need for water increases. So as the leaf matures, it's going to grow in size as in uh, it's going to have a greater number of cells in its structure. And so its need for sugars is also going to increase. However, as it matures, it is also able to carry out photosynthesis for itself due to the chloroplasts, many chloroplasts that are present in the leaf. And so they would be able to provide its growing need of the sugar molecules. And to synthesize those sugar molecules, water would still be needed. And in fact, as the sugar amount of sugar synthesized increases, the requirement for water would also increase as the number of cells are increasing while the leaf matures. B. The features listed in Table 2.1 are present in one or more of the three cell types. So you've got companion cell, phloem sieve tube element, and xylem vessel element. Complete Table 2.1 by using a tick if the feature is present and a cross mark if the feature is absent. So cytoplasm is present in companion cells. Uh, and some amount of it is also present in phloem sieve tube element. However, it's absent from xylem vessel elements since uh, these are made of dead cells. Similarly, cell surface membranes are present in companion cell and phloem sieve tube element. Again, xylem vessel is absent there because xylem vessel elements are made of dead cells. 
Lignified cell walls are only present in xylem vessel elements and absent from the first two types of structures. And nucleus is only present in companion cells since the absence of nucleus reduces the resistance to the flow of substances in the two vessels. Some cell signaling molecules are steroid hormones or lipids. These hormones are these hormones are transported in the bloodstream to reach capillary networks. At a capillary network, hormones pass out of the blood into tissue fluid. A figure 3.1 is a diagram of a capillary network. One describes the differences between blood arriving at the arterial end of the capillary network and uh, the tissue fluid surrounding the body cells. So the differences between blood and tissue fluid. Well, first off, the blood contains red blood cells and plasma proteins, which are too large to leave the capillaries. And so the tissue fluid does not contain them. And blood coming in at the arterial end also has greater concentration of oxygen and glucose than that in the tissue fluid. So those would be part points that I'll be writing in my answer. Two, not all the tissue fluid passes back into blood capillaries to enter the bloodstream. Some of the tissue fluid drains into blind ended vessels such as vessel X shown in figure 3.1 or this one still over here. Name the fluid that is formed in vessel X. Hormone S is a steroid hormone involved in cell signaling. Figure 3.2 shows the sequence of events that occurs when hormone S enters a target cell. So here is the cell surface membrane of the target cell. And this is hormone S is represented by this black dot over here, where these two structures represent cell membrane, uh, cell surface membrane receptors. So you you'd find them in the cell surface membrane. And then we have another two two other symbols for cytoplasmic receptors. So receptors found in the cytoplasm. And then there's this nuclear receptor, uh, which you'd be able to see in here inside the nuclear uh, envelope. And then there's this messenger RNA. And last but not least, we have a polypeptide represented by this beaded strand. B, explain why the hormone S shown in figure 3.2 does not need to pass through a transport protein to enter the cytoplasm of target cell. All right, as mentioned uh, previously in the question, these hormones are lipids, meaning that they are hydrophobic in nature. And the fatty acid tails that make up the interior of the cell surface membrane are also hydrophobic, which is why they allow the movement of hormone S through them and do not act as barriers. C. The target cell can respond to other cell signaling molecules in addition to hormone S. The cell has receptors in the cell surface membrane in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. Explain why hormone S binds only with receptor R in the cytoplasm and not with the other receptors as shown in figure 3.2. As you can see, these uh, cell receptors have a specific shape and so each receptor can only or each molecule can only bind with a particular receptor, which is why uh, hormone S is, uh, the receptor for hormone S is complementary or specific to it. And so it can only bind with that particular receptor. D, the hormone receptor complex shown in figure 3.2 enters the nucleus and binds to DNA. This, this switches on a gene coding for a polypeptide that is synthesized in the cytoplasm. One, name the structure through which the hormone receptor complex, complex enters the nucleus. So it can only enter through the gap that is in the nuclear envelope, and that would be nuclear pore. Two, the, name the processes occurring at B and C. All right. At B, there's this messenger RNA that is transcribed from DNA. So B would be transcription. And at C, you've got this structure G where the mRNA is used to form a, to synthesize a polypeptide, which is um, transcription. And so because a polypeptide is, is synthesized using an mRNA use, at the structure G, this is probably a ribosome. Name the structure G, so that would be ribosome again. 
E-cell signaling by Hormon S results in the production of a functional globular protein molecule composed of three identical polypeptide chains. After the synthesis of three of these polypeptides, changes need to occur to form the functional globular protein molecule. Outline the changes that need to occur to form the functional globular protein molecule. In order to identify those changes, uh, you need to know uh, what specifically is a globular protein molecule. So this would be a three-dimensional structure that has a particular shape. Also, the in a globular protein, the hydrophobic amino acids are projected into the inside the structure, and the hydrophilic uh, amino acid or amino acids that have hydrophilic R groups are projected or exposed to the external environment to get to form hydrogen bonds with water and dissolve inside it. So to form this three-dimensional structure using the polypeptide that already has the primary structure, you'd first form the secondary structure that would be made using hydrogen bonds. So that could be alpha helix or beta pleated sheets. And then you'd form the three-dimensional structure using the bonds, hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, uh, disulfide bonds, or weak, weak hydrophobic interactions. And that is how you'd form the three-dimensional structure. And to join together the three polypeptides, you'd need quaternary structure of a protein molecule. And so you'd reach the globular protein molecule at the end. For a person who is exposed to tobacco smoke is at a greater risk of lung cancer and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Many people with COPD have both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. These diseases cause changes in the gas exchange system. For example, changes occur in the total lung surface area to volume ratio. A tar in tobacco smoke has a number of effects on the cells lining the gas exchange system. State the main effects of tar on the cells lining the gas exchange system that are related to lung cancer and to chronic bronchitis. So tar is a carcinogen that can cause mutations in pulmonary cells. And if, if these mutations make on the other side of the immune response, this can switch off the tumor suppressor genes of the cells of the pulmonary cells and cause uncontrolled mitosis, which would then lead to cancer. And as for chronic bronchitis, Tar would damage cilia and this would this could inhibit their motion. Tar could also lead to goblet cells uh, swelling to a large size. So if the sweeping motion of cilia is prevented, mucus would not be uh, swept away from the gas exchange surface surface and it would and then it would accumulate over there. B, a student investigated the effect of surface area to volume ratio on diffusion. Agar was prepared with universal indicator solution and sodium hydroxide solution. The agar was colored blue. Three cubes A, B, and C were cut from a solid blue, uh, solid block of blue agar. Each cube was a different size. Universal indicator solution changes to a red color in the presence of acid. The student prepared table 4.1 to show the sizes and surface area to volume ratio of each cube. Complete table 4.1 by writing the correct units for volume and calculating the total surface area and volume of cube C. So the volume uh, unit would be centimeters cube since we have centimeters square in the surface area. For the total surface area, we would find out the surface area of one side. So that would be 3 times 3, which would be equal to 9. And then you would multiply that by 6 since there are 6, cube, six sides of a cube. And as for the volume, you just cube uh, 3 and that would be equal to 27. C cubes A, B and C were placed in a small beaker at time 0 seconds. Dilute hydrochloric acid was added to the beaker to cover the cubes. The student timed how long it took for each cube to change color completely. Complete uh, figure 4.1 to show the results that are observed. All right, so the cubes contain sodium hydroxide and in the presence of hydrochloric acid, they are going to change color. And this speed of the changing of color depends on the speed of diffusion or the rate of diffusion. The rate of diffusion is fastest in a smaller body. And so that would have a greater surface area to volume ratio, which is A. This would be followed by B. 
which has a smaller surface area to volume ratio and then C which has the smallest surface area to volume ratio. So the rate of diffusion would be slowest in C and fastest in A. These some people with emphysema may be offered lung volume reduction in which diseased lung tissue is surgically removed. As mentioned over here in diseased lung tissue uh, surface area to volume ratio can decrease and as it is well known that the alveoli in the lungs provide the greatest amount of surface area and so that means in a damaged tissue the alveoli are damaged as a result of which the surface area decreases. One expected outcome of the sur surgery is an improvement in total lung surface area to volume ratio suggests so why there is an improvement in total lung surface area after the to volume ratio after the surgery has been carried out. So once the damaged tissue is has been removed that means the area of the lung which had reduced surface area has been removed. Now because that area is removed the total volume of the lung decreases and now the total surface area is only the surface area of the lung tissue which was healthy which had not been damaged and so uh, since the volume reduces and the actual functional lung surface area remains the same the surface area to volume ratio increases e in humans blood that becomes oxygenated in the lungs reaches body tissues without coming into contact with blood that is deoxygenated Explain how the blood that becomes oxygenated in the lungs is kept separate from blood that is deoxygenated. So once the blood is oxygenated in the lungs, it is carried to the heart by pulmonary, using the pulmonary vein and it enters the left side of the heart which is kept separated from the right side of the heart by septum because the right side of the heart contains deoxygenated blood and so that is how they do not mix together. 5. Figure 5.1 is a transmission electron micrograph showing parts of two plant cells. The function of middle lamella is cell to cell addition. The middle lamella is composed of a polysaccharide known as pectin. Pectin interacts with the polysaccharides cellulose and hemicellulose in the cell walls of plant cells so that the cell walls are held together as shown in figure 5.1. Alright, so there's the middle lamella that we're talking about. A cell structure X in figure 5.1 is a cytoplasmic channel with strands of cytoplasm passing through the cell walls of the two cells. Name cell structure X and state one form function of the cell structure. It is the plasmodes matter since it allows the movement of cytoplasm and it's present to allow transport of water molecules with, with solutes between adjacent cells. B. Researchers have discovered that pectin is synthesized within the Golga body. Golga vessels contain pectin, containing pectin are moved to the cell surface membrane for release. One suggests why researchers would not ha have investigated rib ribosomes as being the possible location for the synthesis of pectin. That's because as mentioned earlier in the question, pectin is a polysaccharide and ribosomes only synthesize polypeptides. To name the mechanism that is used to transport pectin out of the cell. Because the transport mechanism is going to use these excretory vesicles, the method would be exocytosis. Juices that are extracted commercially from fruits can be made less cloudy by the breakdown of the cell wall using the enzyme cellulase, pectinase and xylanase. Where cellulase hydrolyzes cellulose, pectinase is for pectin, and xylanase hydrolyzes hemicellulose. C figure 5.2 is a graph showing the effect of cellulose concentration on the activity of cellulase, which is used in making fruit juice less cloudy. Describe and explain the curve shown in figure 5.2. So this curve shows how the uh, how increasing the concentration of substrate affects the rate, uh, rate of reaction. So as the concentration of cellulose increases, the rate of reaction also increases, and then it uh, starts to slow down because initially um, the cellulose concentration is a limiting factor and many of the active sites are not saturated and then as the cellulose concentration increases the number of enzyme substrate complex forming increases which therefore increases the rate of reaction. Eventually there comes a point where uh, none of the active sites are left all of them are saturated and so the number of enzyme substrate complex forming 
remains constant and therefore the rate of reaction also becomes constant. The ultrasound is one possible method that can be used to destroy microorganisms that contaminate fruit juices. Ultrasound is the term given to the sound waves that are out of the range of human hearing. An investigation was carried out into the effect of ultrasound on the activity of cellulase, pectinase and xylenase used in fruit juice manufacture. For each enzyme, the effect of ultrasound was compared with no ultrasound on the maximum rate of reaction, the Michaelis maintained constant and the catalytic efficiency, which is the maximum velocity of enzyme divided by the Michaelis maintained constant. Table 5.1 summarizes the results. A higher maximum velocity to Michaelis maintained constant ratio indicates a higher catalytic efficiency. One, in terms of changes in the interaction between enzyme and substrate when ultrasound is used, suggest explanations for the lower Michaelis Menten constant for pectinase and the higher maximum rate of reaction for xylenase as shown in figure 5.1. The Michaelis Menten constant value is inversely proportional to the enzyme enzyme's affinity for its substrate, and so if the enzyme pectinase has a lower Michaelis Menten constant value as a due to ultrasound that means ultrasound is increasing the affinity of this enzyme for its substrate meaning that it becomes easier for its substrate to bind onto the active site and as for the highest maximum rate of reaction if ultrasound is causing a greater maximum rate of reaction for xylenase that means the hydrolysis uh, happens faster and so the xylenase works faster forming the product in less time by increasing the rate of enzyme substrate complex formation. To explain whether the data shown in figure 5.1 table 5.1 supports the recommendation that ultrasound can be used in the manufacture of fruit juices. Um, the table also shows that the ratio of maximum rate of reaction to Michaelis Menten constant or the higher catalytic efficiency is achieved by uh, the use of ultrasound in each of the enzymes. As you can see for cellulose, without ultrasound it is 29 and with ultrasound it is 34 and the rest of the two enzymes also have similar cases and so the data in the table does support that recommendation. Six, the diseases Misthenia gravis and HIV AIDS both involve disorders of the immune system. Eight, the cause of Misthenia gravis involves a response by B lymphocytes. Explain why Misthenia gravis is called a disorder of the immune system because this is an autoimmune disease that is caused when the immune system is unable to distinguish between self and non-self antigens. Studies have indicated that T lymphocytes are involved in stimulating the B lymphocyte response that causes Misthenia gravis. Research has been carried out on a vaccine that will provide a person with active immunity against these T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Suggest and explain how this vaccine will provide a person with the active immunity against the T and B lymphocytes responsible for causing Misthenia gravis. Alright, so this vaccine will have antigens that are similar in shape to the T and to the particular T and B lymphocytes that cause Misthenia gravis. And so B lymphocytes in that person that uh, function well or function properly that also have receptors complementary to these antigens in the, from the vaccine will undergo clonal selection and clonal expansion. So the B lymphocytes that are supposed to be um, producing antibodies against the antigens that are similar in shape to these uh, T and B lymphocytes that cause Misthenia gravis. After the clonal selection and clonal expansion, we'd have plasma cells that would form, uh, that would synthesize antibodies against these antigens, the antigens from the vaccine. And some of the B lymphocytes would also be stored as memory cells as that would give the person active immunity. See, many people who are living with HIV uh, develop tuberculosis. If a person does not have any symptoms of TB, 
One preventative measure is to prescri prescribe antibiotics. This reduces the overall number of cases of TB and deaths from TB. Suggest so the disadvantage of prescribing antibiotics, antibiotics as a preventative measure against TB. This could increase the risk of the bacteria developing resistance to the, those particular antibiotics. The figure 6.1 is a summary of some of the statistics published by UNAIDS, which is the Joint United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS about HIV and HIV or AIDS for the year 2017. The figures shown in figure 6.1 for 2017 are estimated. One other statistic published by uh, UNAIDS indicated that in 2017, only 75% of the estimated 36.9 million people living with HIV knew that they had been infected with the virus. So out of the total 36.9 million of the people that were infected, only 75% of the people were aware of the fact that they were infected and the rest 25% of the people did not know that they were infected. Maybe it's because they did not show the sim symptoms or for uh, some other reason. Uh, but we're not getting into that for now. With reference to the information in figure 6.1, discuss the importance of this statistic. It's also shown that 21.7 million people were provided with antiretroviral therapy. So antiretroviral therapy would be uh, is used against retroviral virus like HIV. Um, so these are virus that use its, their whole cell to synthesize DNA from the virus, virus's own RNA. And so this therapy would prevent that from happening. It's also shown that almost half of the people that are provided with ART while still living with HIV do not have detectable levels of virus in their blood. Essentially, patients who got the ART might have a better life quality, which is a desired condition for an infected person. But in order to receive that ART, the person has to know that he is infected. If 75% of the people are unaware of their own infection, the rest 25% of the total 36.9 million, that would be 25 over 100 multiplied by 36.9, which would be equal to 9.2 million people who do not know that they are infected with HIV, would not be able to receive this ART or the therapy. And therefore, this could increase their risk of dying or them not having a quality life, which is why it's important for the infected person to be aware of their own infection. Alright, so this is it. We are done with this paper. Thank you for watching.